Chapter 3 A Long Hot Summer Part 1 I wasn't yet convinced that I wanted to be a teacher, so I didn't teach. I worked in an office. There were only five other people in the organisation. After one month, it felt as if we were all adrift in the Pacific on a boat without oars. Who was going to get eaten first? Not me. I and a young woman who had started work with me handed in our resignations. She went on to become a famous figure in the 1997 Labour government. As for me, I was missing the tumultuous life of schools, the variety and the challenge. Blocked by Division 5 of the ILEA, I applied to Division 8. It was the early 70s and for the first time in my life I was to meet a large number of children whose parents had recently migrated from the Caribbean, Western and Southern Asia and Africa. I was to encounter the problems of relations between the races. At Sir John Cass and Redcoat, less than 1% of the children had Commonwealth backgrounds. At the first school I worked at in Southwark, this figure was 10%. At the second, it was 40%. It was at the one with 10% that the problems of racial differences arose. It seemed that a 10% minority constituted a group large enough to be aware of itself, large enough to be visible, yet not large enough to defend itself with confidence. Kingsdale, the first school was mixed. William Penn, the second, was for boys only. Having both sexes on site seemed to make racial antagonisms worse. When romances developed across race lines, as they inevitably did, there were rumblings about crossing over or betrayal. Frequently, conflicts of some intensity would develop. However, once the numbers of brown-skinned pupils rose to 40%, as at William Penn, the fears and suspicions on both sides seemed to vanish, and relationships between the different groups flourished. No longer was colour a political issue, and children were able to focus on the factors that united them, such as football, music and style. Also, as the boys at William Penn did not have to cope with heterosexual relationships within school, they may have found it easier to sort out racial problems. Such conflicts as did take place were mostly concerned with establishing the pecking order, which was usually determined by size and strength. There may be a reflection of these trends in society as a whole. Who knows? I'm no social scientist. I was just a supply teacher, and I found it hard enough doing what I was paid to do, which was to teach French to 11 and 12-year-olds. If I were to teach the children at Kingsdale successfully, I could not simply trot out the old grammatical lessons which I'd got away with at Westcliff. The pupils who now sat in front of me had little built-in respect for education or teachers and none for the French. Soon I began to drown in my own incompetence. I didn't think that my colleagues in the French department were very much happier. Mr Grave, the second in department, would beat miscreants at lunchtime on Friday after which the whole department would go down to the pub and get drunk. Occasionally the head of the department, a Francophile, might wish to add a little je ne sais quoi to Friday afternoons and would bring in a selection of French wines for après-école. I did not blame them. 
I certainly accepted their hospitality from time to time and I recognised the need to find a way to release some of the awful pressures from which teachers in this school were suffering. This was a time of great confusion and change in London schools. Comprehensives were new. Few people understood what they were designed to achieve. Kingsdale was purpose-built as a comprehensive and it had good facilities, but its size, 2,000 pupils and scale, made familiarity with anything or anybody almost impossible. Both pupils and staff were scared and insecure. Nobody felt that they belonged and everybody felt alienated. There were new and challenging ideas with which to contend. The idea that a child might actually enjoy learning was new. The idea that education was for the fulfilment of individual children was new. Mixed ability teaching was new. Child-centred learning was new, although it had already made advances in the primary schools. The ideas that had motivated Chris Searle were new. In the staff room at Kingsdale there were heated discussions. Yet very little understanding of how to apply these new concepts emerged. It was easier to stick to what you knew, particularly if you were over 30 and had been brought up with the notion that children were to be trained to read and write, obey and take up a position in a factory without making too much of a nuisance of themselves. However, positions in factories were running dry. Unemployment was becoming an issue in 1972. What careers were we teaching these children for? If we didn't know, the pupils and their parents probably had even less idea. Intense and emotional arguments also took place among teachers about race, immigrants and culture. Teaching children with unfamiliar backgrounds was a new experience for many of the teachers for whom the idea of a challenging and exotic cultural experience was a holiday in Spain. Their reactions to this situation ranged from concern to ignorant, to plain hostile. Kingsdale was a cauldron of discontent. Everyone, staff and children, suffered from the same sense of unease and insecurity. Some expressed their discontent by being resentful, hostile and occasionally violent. The head teacher was attacked and wounded by an angry pupil, wielding an axe. Some of the staff demanded security guards on site with Alsatian dogs to keep our children in and those from other schools out. Other teachers decided to move on. In September 1972, Kingsdale was short of 50 teachers at the start of the term. <music> Meanwhile, I had my own classroom troubles to contend with. One morning, I arrived to find that it was on fire. Leaving the children lined up outside it, I got some water and managed to put it out before too much damage was done. I reported the matter to the head. Well, let me make a note of it, he said, with the air of a man who was tired of making notes about fires. Has the smoke cleared? Good. Well, carry on. As I turned to leave, he added, do let me know if you have any further problems of that nature. On another occasion, whilst teaching a class of 11-year-olds, I noticed a boy 
hitting other children with a ruler. I told him firmly that he must stop and that he should remain behind after school. When the bell sounded, he immediately tried to leave. I held him and sat him down until all the other children had gone. I wanted to talk to him about his behaviour and make him write a letter of apology to the children he'd hit. The boy got up and charged towards the door. I stood in his path and pushed him back. He tried to get past me to reach the door. I pushed him back again. He threw himself at me and began to hit me with his fists. He punched me on the nose. My eyes watered. I felt a rage boiling up. I was ready to kill him. I let him go. Alone in the classroom, I burst into tears. I hadn't known what to do. I had not gone into teaching to have fights with 11-year-olds. I collected myself and went home. The next day I reported the incident to the head of year. Nothing was done. The head of year was dealing with 30 incidents like this every day. Most were of a far more serious nature than this. I realised that I was pretty much on my own in those classrooms and that confrontation with a pupil was not a good idea, especially if you were a supply teacher. There were moments of brightness in the gloom. Kingsdale had a good art department and produced stunning work in stained glass. There was a wonderful music department with four large bands operating. They were nice enough to let me join in with my saxophone after school. Some of the children I sat next to in the band went on to become well-known professional players. Even in my own French class, I had a brief moment of hope for the future. As usual, the class was not responding. The children were arguing and shouting. I then spotted a 12-year-old girl reading something. Amidst all that chaos, here might be a small pool of sanity. What are you reading? I inquired. The life of Gauguin, sir. I'm really interested in his paintings. He was such an unusual person, wasn't he? I very much wanted to sit down and talk to the girl. But restoring order out of chaos was the priority. If only so she could continue to read undisturbed. She proved to be hardened to the conditions and carried on reading irrespective of my ability to restore order. Now there was a true academic. In spite of these happier moments, I, like the rest of the staff, knew that the school was, like many other schools in London at that time, in serious trouble. After I had moved on to William Penn the following term, I learnt that 300 children from the neighbouring Tulse Hill School had attacked Kingsdale. Every window on the ground floor of the entire building had been smashed. The police had been called in. It had been arrived. A long hot summer, part two. When I arrived there in the summer of 1972, a sort of truce between boys and staff had been declared. 
everyone seemed to be completely aware that they were in an inadequate and confused situation. The head was so busy with union business that he was hardly ever there. Lacking direction from above, the aim of the rest of the staff was to get through the term without too much damage either to themselves or the school. The boys wanted to be left alone to establish their pecking order and pursue their hobbies. In one of my classes, a young man was exercising with a chest expander. I suggested that he put it away. I wouldn't do that, sir, said a small boy to my right. He'll do you in. I took another look at the youth with the expander. He stood up. He was six feet two and around 200 pounds. His muscles bulged beneath his black uniform jacket as he stretched the expander across his chest. Mr Davis, I said, you have a very fine physique and I respect the fact that you put in hours of work to attain it. However, this is not the appropriate time or place for this activity. Yeah. I'm afraid not. Yeah. Yes. What are you in training for? Shot. Sure. Putting? Yeah. South London Youth Championships. Really? Could I come and watch? All right. Good. Have you won any competitions before? Oh, by the way, perhaps that expanded should be put away. Be a shame if it was damaged, wouldn't it? Cool. Well, sir, I won a medal in the junior competition last year. Negotiations like this took place every day. The old presumptions on the teacher's authority were gone along with the cane. New systems of control had not yet emerged, and with the head away all the time, they weren't likely to. Occasionally, a teacher would revert to old-school tactics. It always ended in violence. The physical education teacher had felt that a boy had been rude to him and should be detained after school. The boy chose to ignore him and leave the school anyway. The teacher attempted to stop the boy at the school gates by force. Soon they were rolling on the ground together. A large crowd of boys who would otherwise have gone home gathered around. Some looked ready to give the teacher a kicking. He was not popular. The boy scrambled up first. He grabbed a cricket bat and raised it, aiming to bring it down on the man's head. I happened to be astride my moped in crash helmet and riding gloves when I saw the melee. I drove straight through the middle of the crowd, who kindly made way. Leaving my moped and feeling safe in my helmet, I snatched the cricket bat from the boy grabbed him from behind and held him in an arm lock. With two steps, the man strode over and hit the boy repeatedly in the stomach with all his force. No, no, I shouted and let the boy go. The latter then launched himself on the man with the ferocity of pain and righteous indignation. The two were joined together in holy rage. With the help of some of the more concerned boys, we separated the warring couple. I told the older pupils to take care of the boy while I escorted the teacher back to the staff room. Both participants were ultimately expelled. clear that if any education was to take place at all, it had to be carried out 
in an atmosphere of mutual respect. When this happened, in spite of the difficulties, good things emerged. There was a jazz band, enthusiastic if scrappy. People worked hard at athletics and football. There were clubs for chess and bridge. One teacher helped the boys run a radio programme over the tannoy at lunchtime, fostering the burgeoning arts of the DJ, the toaster, the rapper and the scratcher. However, resources were poor. The boys had to spend 40 minutes in a coach to get to a playing field. By the time they got there, it was almost time to come back. At the school, there was a playground the size of two tennis courts onto which 1,400 boys were crammed. 500 ball games were going on at once on this patch of concrete. Speed of reaction was absolutely vital if one was to survive till the bell went for afternoon school. William Penn's classrooms overlooked parklands belonging to a private school for girls. Every so often a small group of girls in gym slips would be trotted out to play netball in the park. 600 boys, those on the park side of the building, would immediately rush to the large windows and gawp until their teachers dragged them back or until the girls went away. It was thoughtful of some 1960s architect to give them a really good view of that which was so desirable and yet so unattainable. Perhaps that is what architects mean when they talk about social engineering. Gawping at the girls in the park was one of the few occasions when sex entered into the life of the school. There were, however, two female teachers who bore the whole brunt of the pent-up feelings of 1,400 adolescent males. They shared the task between them thus. The first was tall and beautiful, with a dreamy, almost ethereal quality. The boys and men worshipped her from afar. She only had to drop a pencil in the corridor and ten pairs of hands would scramble to be the one to present it and say, Here, yeah, miss. Oh, thank you, Billy, she cooed and would wander off, seemingly oblivious. The other woman was cheerful, French and down to earth. Kiss a kiss, miss, the boys would say as they jumped all over her until pulled off by some passing teacher. She endured all this with extreme good patience and humour. Such good-natured stoicism served as the oil that lubricated the rickety old machinery of William Penn's school. However, an event occurred midway through the summer term that almost brought that machinery grinding to a halt. A woman at the local railway station was murdered as the result of a mugging. The police believed that the perpetrator of the crime was one of the boys at the school. They set up camp in the headmaster's office in which they interviewed all the witnesses and likely suspects. As this proved to be most of the boys in the school, the police remained on site for the next six weeks. When the holidays finally arrived, nobody had yet been charged. I never did hear the outcome of the case. For me, term had ended, not a moment too soon, and I was quite ready to move on. In 1981, the government set up a commission under Lord Scarman, which painstakingly examined the reasons for the Brixton riots of that year. Any Southwark teacher could have told him that similar riots were likely at any time during the 70s, and most of us already knew.